Hello and welcome back as we conclude our video series on the Yamas and the Niyamas. This video will be about Ishvara Pranidhana, which is the fifth of the Niyamas and is often described as devotion to God. Now, the word God can be very complex, very complicated, and simply hearing this word could provoke some of your students, some of your listeners, or you perhaps to shut off um, receptivity to the information. God's a complex concept. I'm not talking about a conscious individual God per se, although I could be. Well, what I'm really talking about is a force that exists in the world that is unexplainable in a divine way. Uh, that could be Mother Nature. It could be the universal consciousness. It could be whatever you recognize it to be or whatever God means to you. My own personal concept of God continues to evolve. It has not been the same, and I don't suspect that it will remain the same. Had you asked me in my teenage years or my early 20s, I would have described myself as an atheist, even though I had an upbringing um, in Catholicism. I had difficulties reconciling this concept of an all-powerful, omniscient being who self-identified as male and seemed to be overly concerned with the sex lives of humans. And from that conflict, I tended to reject the idea as my only exposure to it was through the monotheistic lens of, of the modern religions. But over time, I've learned to soften my definition, or maybe soften is not the right the maybe soften is not the right word, maybe it's more broaden my definition of what God is and and reclaim the idea of spirituality um, as something that is not associated with an organized religion, but in but in accepting, understanding, feeling that there is something larger at play in the universe than what meets the eye. I think whether you want to call it God or nature or the universe, whatever you call it, most of us would agree in some way that there is more than meets the eye of our physical existence. Not everything is coincidence. There's something at play um, behind the veil of our reality, and we can call that divinity. And it doesn't have to be something that is commanded that we believe in out of fear of eternal damnation. Um, it's more just a connection um, to the deepest aspects of ourselves. Let me, let me put it like this. So I'm sure you've woken up from a Shavasana a very deeply fulfilling Shavasana after an asana practice, after a yoga practice. And you just had this incredible connection, this feeling of connection, this empathy towards the world around you, towards the people in the room, towards the people in your life. And you walked out of that yoga class feeling absolutely amazing. Well, I've experienced similar um, feeling similar experiences um, when I'm in places of indescribable natural beauty. When you're high, highly elevated on a mountain trail and you're just looking out as far as the eye can see over the horizon and you're taking in the beauty of the world, the beauty of the planet, you have a feeling, a sense inside that's not too unlike that sense of internal peace that you feel at the end of a excellent Shavasana. When you're standing um, on a gorgeous beach, watching the sunset, smelling the salt air on, an, on a warm summer day, there's a magicalness in the air, a sense of connection, a sense that there is more to this world than what you can see, what you can realize. You have a sense that you are just a piece and something much larger. 
this is a connection to God, and it doesn't have to be um, towards a physical being manifested um, through ancient literatures. Let me take a step back for a moment from this perspective. Scientists now estimate that the universe, the current universe, is almost 14 billion years old. Now, the human mind cannot even comprehend the enormity of that number. The human mind cannot comprehend 14 billion years. We can't even comprehend how much money Elon Musk makes. So the universe is 14 billion years old. The Earth, the planet that we live on, is 4.5 billion years old. Life that we're aware of didn't exist on this planet until 3.5 billion years ago. And through all the natural selections, all the genetic mutations, um, through all of the centuries, the eons, the millennia, we end up with human beings, extremely complex organisms. Now, I don't need to tell you how amazingly complex um, our genetics are, how uh, amazingly complex our thoughts are, our capacity to observe, perceive, and comprehend. Homo sapiens, creatures with our genetic makeup, basically our species, have been on the planet for 300,000 years. Yet we only know our written and oral histories going back 12,000 years. So for the majority of our own people's existence on this planet, we have no concept, no idea what life was like for them. Yoga has its roots going back 5,000 years. So through all of the eons of time, 14 billion years, stars colliding, gases forming, cells being formed, occurrences happening to result in this, us here today communicating through this electronic device. The sheer probability of that seems to be almost divine in its complexity. And yet, the world is not supposed to be any certain way. The world is what it is, and I actually dislike that saying, it is what it is. It's always bugged me when, when someone has basically written off a question or an observation with that simple statement. It is what it is. It has never been a satisfactory answer to me. And I think because the nature of the world is that we will never have a satisfactory answer to what it is to what it is we're experiencing, what it is we're comprehending. We can never know everything. We never have the full picture. We never have all of the information, as frustrating as that is. And through our observation of the natural world, the natural order of things, the process of life, we know that the world is, is was, always going to end. It's a matter of fact. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And I'm not saying this in a way that reprehends nihilism. I'm not suggesting that the world is going to end anyway, so nothing matters. It's quite the opposite. What I'm saying is that the world is going to end regardless of any choices and decisions that we make. And how we get to the finish line does matter. We can go to the finish line being angry with people because they didn't believe that global warming was a thing or that they should get vaccinations or that they didn't vote for your candidate. We can be angry that people's diets created greenhouse gases or that people traveled on planes too much and those created greenhouse gases too. Each of us can become angry and offended by all of the things that we feel is out of our control we can become angry and offended by all of the things that we perceive are hastening the world to its end. Or we can choose to go there with kindness and with empathy. We all make our choices and decisions um, best based on how we feel is the best way for ourselves to be. 
Um, and, and this is the best that we can do. Uh, so you be you, I'll be me, they be they. And then whatever happens afterwards was meant to happen. The only thing that you can really control is the things that you do in this life. So you and I, we will make our choices, our decisions based upon being the best people that we can be. And then everything else, so to speak, is in God's hands or the universe's hands or Mother Nature's hands or fill in the blank. One example of this in action um, was Gandhi's peace movement. I know I've talked about this in another of the videos. But not everybody was on board with, um, with Gandhi's call for nonviolent resistance to the British occupation. There were many who were on the side of, uh, of forceful resistance. The British were weakened by the events of World War II, and there was a strong movement to rise up. It was time to take the country back. They implored Gandhi, what if, your, what if your insistence on a peaceful movement doesn't work? And Gandhi's reply to them was, it doesn't matter. This is the best way for us to be. This is the way that we should conduct ourselves. And whatever happens after that will happen. Oddly, I have a similar story in my own life. Um... In 2011, 2012, I was considering leaving the corporate job that I was in. I worked in insurance before I was a yoga teacher full time. But I wasn't happy with that career. And I, I knew I needed to make changes um, for myself. But this is a very scary thing for us to do, to drastically change and alter the course of our lives. I had a very comfortable existence. I had a nice salary. I had good benefits. Um, but I knew deep down inside that it wasn't my calling. And so I had a lot of internal conflict about what I should do next. I mean, deep down inside, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to be a yoga teacher, but it didn't seem practical or pragmatic for me to pursue that. And then one evening, as I was walking down a street in Portland, Oregon, um, I saw a sign that was written into a steamed glass. Someone had taken their finger and, and written on the glass. And the saying that they had written on the glass said, leap and the net will appear. And this message came to me at the exact moment in time that I needed to hear it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right at the same time when I was struggling with a decision that I needed to make, there was this message of reassurance that, that as long as you acted in a manner that your heart tells you to act, that's all you can ask of yourself and you have to leave whatever happens after that to, for lack of a better way of saying it, a divine, uh, a divine judgment, a divine um, uh, presence to handle that. Surrender to a higher power. Surrender to God. Leap and the net will appear. Isvara Pranidhana.